Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to the series where I run through my Curse of Strahd for Shattered Ark campaign. This is part 12 of that series, which is kind of crazy to me <laughs> that we didn't do it for 12 episodes. Um, I guess 13 if you count part 0. But this is... Um, we've actually played quite a few times since uh, my last update, but I've decided to do them a little less frequently. For one reason, just a handful of people watch them. But for another reason, um, I like to combine these videos with prep you know, for my for my upcoming session, and I've done a lot of that prep already for this part of the for this part of the campaign. So there's not a whole lot of reason for me to do a you know weekly update as we go through my sessions. Rather, I'll do you know every couple, every every two or three or four sessions, I'll kind of combine them into one. Also, because sometimes in the session there's not much that happens except role playing and, and discussion, and then sometimes they're really action packed. And so I'll try to combine them, you know, and <laughs> and, and make them uh, just kind of flow together a little bit better. Um, one thing that really was really really fun is that one of my players, I mean, it's yeah, partially fun, partially not. One of my players had to drop out for a bit. Uh, so the player who was playing Pavel, um, I talked about this in my last one, but he just had a lot of stuff going on in his life and he was moving and all this stuff. So he had to really step away from the campaign for a few weeks. And so as a result, we only had three players. Uh, and Pavel, as a character, stayed behind in Velaki when the party moved out to Kresik. Now, one of the questions that he had, that player had, was I do want to come back, but... If I come back, or when I come back, do I want to come back as Pavel, or do I want to, do I want to make a new character? And he kind of went back and forth on that. He liked Pavel, but the player is really gregarious, he's really outgoing, he's really talkative, he likes playing charismatic, intelligent characters who can engage with the lore, and engage with other you know, NPCs and the other players in a really you know, talkative, uh, front way. And that's how he usually plays, is that kind of character. But Pavel was the opposite of that. Pavel was really stoic, he was really quiet, um, you know, laconic. He was a combat character primarily. He didn't have a lot of out-of-combat abilities. He didn't do a lot with the lore. He was really there to provide kind of a stoic, occasionally maybe even more comic relief, but not like in a really out... kind of more of like a straight man, I guess. He kind of played off of Arthur, who's much more kind of clownish. And I mean that in, a, you know, in an affectionate way. Um, he was much more you know straight man, you know witty remark here and there, but mostly just was there for the combats and stuff, and that's not the kind of character that the player tends to enjoy. So while he liked the character in a lot of ways, he thought, you know, I think I'm just going to leave him behind. I think I'm going to make a new character. So he made a new character, and he joined in this very last session that we played just last Monday. Um, and it's great. It's so much more, it fits so much more with his style. Immediately, the energy just went way up. So, but I'll talk about that in a bit. So, when the players left Velaki, last time I talked about this, they were ambushed on the road, they had that fight, they got to Kresik, and they saw those um, effigies outside the walls, they talked to the guard, and the guard just said witches, right? And that's kind of where, where I had last updated you guys. Um, well, Kresik, as they kind of went in, it was really different than I was expecting. You know, it's funny how that happens. Like, I'll have prepared a place, and then the way I describe it, the way the players interact, the places they choose to go, you know, move the narrative a certain way, and I adapt to it, and things change from what I had prepared and what I had imagined. So they didn't go rushing into the city. They didn't, you know, they, they were they took their time and they discussed things. They, they were cautious. They didn't go to the market square where there was a witch burning and so they didn't have that whole moment of like, uh oh, do we save this person or not? That didn't come up. They just knew that there was, uh, there were witches in town. They were like, okay, this is gonna be tricky. What are we going to do here? And they discussed it for quite a while, uh, just uh, just inside the gate, like what they should do. Should we skip this entirely? Should we go straight to the Abbey? Do we want to get involved in this whole thing? And by the time they had kind of made up their minds, it was late. And I was like, they're not going to burn, you know, they're not going to do that whole scene that I had kind of planned in my head of them going into the city, meeting this witch burner, you know, this, this inquisitor basically from the Abbey, and that, that wasn't going to happen. So instead, they went straight to the watch, basically. They went straight to the... Uh, the uh, city guard and started to talk to them and they're like, hey, we're from the abbot. We're here to help. What's going on? And the guy was like, oh my goodness, thank you. Someone from the, someone from Velaki, someone from the abbot. Good. You know, this guy's name is Abner. He's Watcher Abner. And he's the guy who is uh, sort of in charge of the, what's left of the uh, law and order in the town that isn't just mob rule, basically. And he's like, look, uh, we had, uh, for the last few weeks, we've had these weird happenings, weird things going on. And then a few days ago, um, the spirits rose and the church burned down and people were like, it's witches, it's got to be witches. And so the Inquisitor came down from the Abbey, this monk, Brother Kylan, and he has been um, 
basically burning suspicious people. <laughs> he and his uh, his goons amongst the townsfolk are rounding up people who are suspicious and they're burning them. And and so the players are like, oh great. Well, we gotta meet this guy. We're from the abbot. Maybe we're from the bishop, rather uh, Bishop Lucian. Maybe there's something we can do. So they went to talk to him, and what they found was, and this is the way they read him, and I think they got a good read on him, was he's this young guy, he absolutely believes what he's doing. He's ultimately maybe trying to be, do what's good, but he's just, you know, completely clueless about what's actually going on. And he's, you know, burning people. <laughs> and so they're like, okay, this guy's dangerous because he's absolutely, he believes what he's talking about. Um, he, he doesn't doubt for a moment and he's completely wrong about everything that's going on. Or so they thought. As it turns out, of course, there were witches. <laughs> now, the, he didn't, they didn't know that. And he doesn't know that he's getting witches. In fact, he's not. But that, that there are witches and that they're doing awful things in Grezik, that's true. And so the players came to realize that as they were going on. So they basically went around town, talked to some people, tried to get some leads about where Esmeralda might have been, and they got two. They, they heard that she had been sniffing around the old windmill uh, to the southwest of town, which they didn't know. None of the townsfolk told them it's called Old Bone Grinder, but that's what it was. This old windmill, I moved it outside Kresik. And then also that the Wizard of Wine's tavern in town had been abandoned, but that there is a winery that corresponds to it, the Wizard of Wine's winery, northwest of the city, uh, about you know half a day's ride away, and that she had been seen at the place and she was known to be friends or at least acquaintances with the owners who had left town a while ago. They had, they had packed up their inn and had left. So they said, okay, well, we can go check out the windmill. We can check out the Wizard of Wines. We could just go straight to the Abbey because Irina and her friend and her friend's servant, they just went up to the Abbey. They just left them behind and said, you know, we'll see you guys later, I guess. <laughs> the Abbey seems safe. We'll go there. You know, foreshadowing and all that. So the players decided what to talk about what they were going to do for a while. And they decided, well, the, the windmill is closer. We can investigate that. And then if we don't find anything, we can go to the Wizard of Wines. So they went to the windmill. Now, there were only three of them. Their big combat person had, had dropped. I had prepared, in, in one of my videos, I had prepared Bone Grinder. And I had a hag and two hag's daughters. That was kind of my plan for that place. But I thought, you know, that is really hard. That, that hag's ability to make them go blind without four players, without that combat character, that's really tough. If they can get a sneak attack off, maybe, but they're not probably going to get a sneak attack off because they're the ones who are going to be doing their, they just appear to be old ladies. The players have no reason to necessarily attack them secretly or under surprise. They don't know what they're getting themselves into. So I adapted on the fly and I said, okay, no, the hag's not going to be there. So it's going to be the two hag's daughters who are much weaker. But then I thought I'm going to make, they have a gift in the second floor of their abbey, which is completely closed off from the light, they are going to have a vampire spawn. So that's a connection to what's going on broadly, but and that's dangerous, but that's something they've dealt with before. So they they had some sort of more protection, but it's not... It, basically, I just didn't want the party to be wiped in a random, uh, you know, <laughs> in a fight with the hags, or with the hag, because I thought that that's just going to kill them. And I think it would have, given how it went, it was already tough, and basically the fact that I rolled badly is the only reason they survived. I mean, really, that's that's basically it. Um, I rolled really badly during the fight. I rolled lots of ones, and so they were they were saved a little bit by that. If I had had a hag in there, I think they all would have died. So I'm glad that I made the change. Some people, I think some some people running this would have been totally fine just putting a hag in there and letting what happened happen, just keeping it as I had prepared it ahead of time. But I thought, you know, I'm not going to change it. I'm not going to change it once I have made this change. But as they're approaching it, I was like, you know, I just don't think they're going to survive this. So I just made that quickly. She's not there. The hag's not there. She's gone. But anyway, so they went in. They tried to sneak in and um, uh, Arthur, the, the thief, did manage to get in on the third floor. Um, and he saw, he saw that this place was, uh, you know, um, very clearly evil. <laughs> there were bones and things everywhere and uh, you know, shredded clothes, and obviously they had been, you know, doing, you know, eating people probably. So he hunted around on the top floor of the place and then heard something down below, and he looked down and he saw this vampire spawn. And he was like, oh no. Now on the bottom floor, um, uh, Varya had stayed outside. She didn't come in. 
Uh, she got a bad feeling about the place she saw the spirits because she has that sort of spectral sight. So she's seeing spirits everywhere. She's like, this is not good. I don't want to go in. So Ulysses, the priest, he went in. Ulysses. And uh, he talked to these two old women. And they seemed very friendly at first. One of them was this old woman that uh, Arthur had seen elsewhere. And then she uh, made it very clear that when he kind of opened up a little bit about why he was there looking for this woman, Esmeralda, he, they had nothing to hide. They said, oh yeah, she was here. But we sent her on. She's a gift. And they were like, oh, a gift? And they were like, yeah, as you will be. And he was like, uh-oh. <laughs> and so he just drew his, his holy symbol or something and like tried to cast a spell. And, and I think he succeeded. Maybe he failed, but the, the witches got mad and angry at that and they, char they attacked him. Meanwhile, upstairs, Arthur is kind of trapped because he could climb out, out the window, but he hears his buddy being attacked downstairs, and so he wants to run down. But there's a vampire spawn in the darkness of that room, and so he's like, oh no, what do I do? Um, and so he came up with this cool plan to get down there. Anyway, the fight went on. Varya burst in. It was, it was a quick fight. Well, it wasn't a quick fight. It was actually a pretty serious fight, but they managed to win. Really, I think at the end of the day, they managed to win just basically by luck. Their strategy was pretty bad. I mean, in terms of, like, they were just scattered. You know, there was a vampire spawn against the thief who couldn't really hurt it. <laughs> the two witches against the one priest who... Uh, his, his really only his defense are his spells, and he's really only that good against undead, and they're not undead. And then Varya stepped in, and um, she was able to help. And, and certainly, of course, over the course of the battle, they, they swung it their way. So they won. So what I had was the, um, the, the two spirits of the witches fled. They, like out of their open mouths, this dark shadow like scurried out the door. And another thing is that when Varya was there, Varya's covered in tattoos or kind of like these spirit tattoos that are all over her body um, that happened to her when she opened the book and read it, the book that she has, the Book of Strahd, the one that cursed her. Well, I described how they had similar shadowy tattoos over their bodies and she's like, uh-oh, that's a connection between me and them. Great. <laughs> so she kind of knows that they're not really witches so much as maybe possessed people or something like that. Um, that there are spirits that are kind of inhabiting their bodies, which is kind of what's happening to her, although she still has control over her spirits and she can kind of let them out a little bit. Okay, so they investigated the entire place and they found, well, rather, Arthur found this, like, crystal orb up in the attic. And I was going to have it be, like, a connection to different places that the hags could see and communicate with and they were going to see Yester Hill. They were going to see a big hill with a big tree. They were going to see, um, and I think that's primarily what they were going to see. So that was going to lead them to the next place. But he shot it. <laughs> he was like, I don't trust this. And he put it on the ground and he shot it with his gun and shattered. And I was like, okay, great. Well, it's a good thing I had the Wizard of Wines as another place they could go. Because as it is right now, they were like, uh, okay, um, awesome. And so rather than force them to do that, I said that they also found a bundle of letters that, that people from the town had written to the witches asking for favors. And it had a lot of the townsfolk, and it had a lot of important people. It had the, the baron of the town, um, and it had uh, a couple other important people that they had run into. And so oh, also during the conversation, Ulysses had discovered that the hag, or the witch, mentioned that Brother Kylan was going to get his, basically. That he wasn't a threat to them, but they were going to they were going to enjoy you know tormenting him or something like that. So clearly he was an enemy to them, but he was not a threat. He wasn't on their tra trail or anything like that. So the players were a little less judgmental of him. They they hated him a little less, but they also thought okay he's basically useless. Um, regardless, one of the letters mentioned Yesterhill because I was like okay they destroyed their clue to it. Um, I'm just going to give them a, a, a clue that has it. So one of the one of the letters said, you know, um, I'll bring it to Yester Hill. I'll bring the offering to Yester Hill or something like that. And they're like, okay, well, where is that? So they went back to town and they went to add the Watcher Abner and they, they gave him the letters and he saw them, including the one from the Baron. And he was like, oh no, <laughs> the Baron is, is, is involved in this. Um, and then he found the, he told him where Yester Hill was. So the Baron's like, okay, well, we could go out there or we could go back to... The Wizard of Wines. We could check that out and see if that's a place that will um, yield us any new facts. Maybe Esmeralda went there. So they decided to go out that way. Uh, so they got their stuff together and, and rode their horses out to the Wizard of Wines. Now what's funny is when they got there, um, I kind of had 
in my mind this idea that, that the Wizard of Wines was going to be taken over by druids and witches and that the people there had been taken. But as they were going there, I was like, well, I don't know if I really want to introduce the whole druid thing. I mean, I, I think I will have a couple people from the town who are involved in the worship of the Lady of the Wood, but I don't know if I want to make them like a big druids and, and all that. So instead of that, I was like, well, I could also just put more witches out there, but that wouldn't be so interesting. I thought, wait, what if the people of the Abbey had given themselves over to the the witches voluntarily? What if they had helped them? And then I thought about the Gulthius tree, and I thought about the fruit from that tree, and I thought about the blights that grow from it, and I was like, what if I did that? So this was kind of on the fly. I decided to adapt that, and so when they got to the Wizard of Wines, it was completely overgrown by fresh green vines and plants that looked a little sick, not like sickly, but like blooming, like un unhealthy blooming in the middle of, you know, the end of fall, right? It's almost winter. And so this looked completely out of place. It looked uh, sick, like unnaturally green. And it was also very recent. Like this was very rapid overgrowth, but the, but the place wasn't old. It wasn't, it hasn't it hadn't been abandoned for years, which would require this sort of growth. And they were like, oh no. And they started to investigate and they found these horrible like pods of growing people but they weren't really people they were blights basically but they were humanoid figures with woody skin and they found them like kind of half awake and the, they were like oh no this place is what is happening they were completely thrown they were like one of the players was like i, I expected witches uh werewolves ghosts vampires i didn't expect you know invasion of the body snatchers and so on the one hand it was kind of a weird tonal shift but i think i actually pulled it around because I started to describe how, like, when they for when they eventually fought them and they, like, cut the vines and stuff, there was, like, this blood spray. And they were like, oh, okay, so it's related to kind of draining of blood and all this stuff. And so I think I turned it around from being, like, pulp sci-fi <laughs> back into pulp gothic horror. Um, more like Castlevania. So in my mind, I was just picturing, like, those enemies in Castlevania with, like, the plants and, like, the, you know, <laughs> that's what I was picturing in my head. Uh, but obviously they hadn't played Castlevania. They were just, like, completely thrown. But it actually worked out because their players were total. The, the players were totally off, you know, on the back foot, and the characters were totally on the back, off the back foot, on the back foot. But anyway, so we kind of ended right there when they saw one of the bodies. That was the in, in between one session, and another one of the players uh, who played Varya couldn't make it to the one after that. But she was like, "I really think we should keep playing. I don't want to be the one who stops the session, you know, and it makes us bog down for a week because we'd already missed a week, I think." So we played with just two players. We played with just um, Arthur and Ulysses. And so what I described was that they sprayed this, like, mist into the air, this, like, pollen into the air, and Varya failed her con check and fell asleep. And she was in this deep slumber, and so she couldn't act. That's how I kind of got her out of it for a session two. And it also made sense because the player wasn't there, so she wouldn't remember what, what had happened. So it was actually kind of cool, and it worked out really well because there was... She was, she was able to sit in on, like, the first 10 minutes of the session, so she was kind of aware of what had happened, but then she didn't really know what had really happened. And so it, it mimicked what Varya would have been like really well. So anyway, the players basically dealt with this for a session. They went down into the cellars. They fought these things. They found the heart, which was this gross, like, seed. But it was, like, you know, a large thing, and it was kind of vaguely like a woody heart. Um, and it had, you know, it had all these vines, come, roots coming from it and vines coming from it that were draining blood. And it was basically the idea is that the Gulthius tree, the fruit of the Gulthius tree, creates these gross, fibrous hearts, seeds, uh, that you plant elsewhere and they grow into, you know, these sort of like viney blood drinkers, things like that. So it, it's a really creepy idea and it comes back to the Gulthius tree. So anyway, they cleared it out and they got a, di a diary and the diary mentioned a couple things. It mentioned Baba, it mentioned Yester Hill, it mentioned the Gulthus tree. I changed it from Gulthius, just Gulthus. The Gulthus tree and it mentioned that it's the Gulthus tree is grown from that which slew the devil which I'm thinking of the stake that they drove through his heart, right? And so uh, it was planted, it grew into this tree, and it's this blood-drinking tree. And so they were like, gross, gross, gross. But Yester Hill is important, obviously. That's where we need to go, Yester Hill. Okay, okay. So, you know, the, the, whenever you do a mystery, whenever you do a breadcrumb thing, you always want to have multiple paths to the, to the end result. That way, they, they, no matter which way the players go, they'll end up there if you want them to do that. Uh, you know, redundant clues. And so they already had done the one, and I thought that that was all they were going to do, but they decided to check. They already had gone to, you know, Bone Grinder, and they'd found the clue to Yester Hill. They just went to, you know, now they had the other. They had confirmation. Okay, that's where we need to go, is Yester Hill. I hope we're not too late, was kind of the idea. That's where Esmeralda's been taken. That's where this, this whole thing goes. So they went back to town, uh, or rather they rested that night. And during the night, a couple things happened. There was a dream 
Everybody had this dream of Ravenloft and the gates of Ravenloft opening and a figure stepping out with burning red eyes saying, welcome to my domain, or you know, you are in my domain now, or something like that. And the figure, most people just thought it was this strange you know, dream, but it was shared by everybody across the entire valley. Anyone who slept that night saw it, which is, of course, it's the return of Strahd. But the, the, the body that Strahd is inhabiting currently is um, Ismark. And so the players who have met Ismark saw it was Ismark who steps out the door with these red eyes, welcome to my domain. And they were like, oh man, and they, they were like, man, he spent too much time with vampires. They just assumed it was just Ismark who had been turned into a vampire or something like that, or that was their dream. But when they related that dream the next session to the player or to, to uh, Varya and to her player, she said, wait, hold on, was it my domain or welcome to like the castle or like, and they were like, he said my domain. And she was like, that's, that's way worse. Because she is the character who knows all about the possession. She knows all about the book. She knows that the, the reason the cult wants the book is to find a vessel for Strahd. And so she's like, oh no, what if that's the devil? Right? What if he's taken uh, you know, Ismark's body? Which is precisely what I've done. So I've had Ismark, because he was taken so early, because the players didn't rescue him or do anything, he is now Strahd. Or rather, Strahd has taken his body. He has infested him. And I think that's what they're going to learn from the abbot who has these visions, who sees what's going on. So if they go to the abbey, they will talk to him and he will tell them, finally. Because they haven't talked to Madame Eva. They didn't get that whole thing. The, the bishop didn't know really what was going on. The abbot will know everything. Because at this point in the campaign, we've been playing, you know, 15, 20 sessions. They are still not sure exactly what is going on. So I think they'll talk to the abbot and he will give them the history of the devil. And he will tell them what the cult is up to. And that way they will know. Maybe not every single detail, but he will, they will, he will know. Now, I don't know what else that Abbott's going to know, but anyway, that's getting ahead of myself. So the players are like, we need to get to Yester Hill. We should go immediately. They asked, or they talked to Abner and told him what was going on. They told him what happened there. And he said, I'm coming with you, right? This is my, uh, this is my domain. Yes, it's right at the edge of my jurisdiction, basically, but, um, the town is, is going crazy. It's like a nightmare. Everything's going wrong. I have to help. And they were like, great. Uh, and so Abner joined them. Now on the way, the, the other player, the player who used to play Pavel, he rejoined the session and he was like, okay, I'm back. You know, I'll, I'll introduce my character to this session. And he's playing a wizard named Titus. It's great. He's this really funny guy. Um, he's like a typical, you might say a typical, not absent-minded, but um, really, really uh, knowledgeable, precise wizard. And he knows like little details and he goes off and talks about, you know, his language is really, really obscure and arcane and it's great. I like him a lot. He's a great character and immediately he meshed with the party really well. Everybody kind of played off him really well and it was great. It was, there was a little bit of humor, just enough to keep things going. But anyway, they were going to Yester Hill. They traveled across country. They got there right as the sun was starting to go down. They got to the wood outside Yester Hill. They traveled to the wood and along the way, they saw signs that somebody else was kind of going ahead of them, had, had walked ahead of them. And then when they got there, they found the ritual going on. There was basically these rings of stones, the Esther Hill, the big tree, and there were cages hanging from the tree of people, or what were people. Only one of them still had someone vaguely alive. It, they weren't quite sure, but it looked like a woman, um, looked like a Vistani woman, and it was definitely Esmeralda. Once they got closer, they saw she had one eye. Um, and so they, it was Esmeralda. That was the sign. Esmeralda only has one eye in this one. So... Um, they were like, well, we need to rescue her. And the ritual was going on was a bunch of people dancing around a fire, and uh, there was chanting and singing, and there was a hut in front of the tree, and there was darkness inside, and they could hear more chanting coming from inside the hut. And it was like um, uh, Titus, who they, they found there sneaking up. He They were like, what are you doing here? He was like, I'm looking for a friend of mine who was taken in this area. <laughs> and his friend is obviously dead, um, probably at the hands of this of this group, this cult, this, these witches. But he was looking for him, and uh, he was like, I'm not part of this, are you part of this? And I'm like, no, 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 we're here to rescue people. And he's like, all right, well, I'm here to, to, to see what I can do, you know. And So they, he just joined them. And it's a good, it was a good, like, introduction to joining because they really saved each other. They really needed help. Uh, there were 12 figures dancing around the fire, and there were extra voices inside. And they knew that the forest had this green, viney growth, too. It had that same look, and they're like, oh, great. So we're going to be so, totally surrounded when we start this, whatever it is. Um... So basically the fight broke out. They tried to sneak around to rescue Esmeralda from the cage, but um, the tree had these tendrils that were growing from it into her skin. And so when they cut them, Arthur cut them, the tree shook and he almost fell. And then 
uh, they heard someone calling out for help from inside the hut, and so they burst up, and uh, and they started to uh, just attack. And it was crazy. Now it was a really good thing that that Titus had chosen Burning Hands, because let me say that spell saved them. He first of all he did Burning Hands on the twelve that were gathered around the fire and roasted them, except three of them were not actually people. They were like um, demon ghoul things. And so they just revealed their forms as these winged, horrible creatures, and they attacked. So they killed nine of them right off the bat with this burst of fire. And then the three ghoul things attacked. And then from inside the hut came out uh, one of the hag's daughters, uh, the same one that they thought they had killed. And she just stepped out. She was not dead. So the fight was against them. And then also vines came up out of the wood, uh, out of the forest. And then the tree itself, which they were trying to climb to get to, to get to Esmeralda, burned them because it had this bloody burning acid sap. And then it would shake and the tendrils were trying to grab them. So it was a really interesting fight because stuff was happening everywhere. They had to get inside the hut, the guy who was calling for help. There was the tree outside. There were the vines coming up the hill trying to get them. There were the three ghouls. And so it was this really frantic running around the battlefield fight. And I was doing group initiative. And so there were, it was just really fun. It was a really cool fight. That was the very, we played that fight for probably like an hour and a half. Um, by the end of it, they had rescued the person from inside the hut who was Brother Kylan. Um, they had, who had been taken by the witches and had been a bit offered as a sacrifice. They had rescued Esmeralda. They had almost gone down like three or four times. Many of them had gone down, lost con. A couple people lost a lot of cons. They're down low. Um, because again, my system of hit points, you lose constitution after you lose your hit. So they're really wounded. A lot of them are, especially I think Arthur and Varya took a lot of damage. Titus took a little bit, but I don't think he went unconscious. He, I think he just lost hit points, actually. He might have stayed up. And I don't even know if... No, I think that Ulysses also took damage. I don't think he he was... Uh, con I don't think his constitution went down, but I think he, he took damage. Regardless, they got inside the hut, and there was one of those hearts there, and it was surrounded by shadow, and then they killed the hag, but then her spirit was trying to possess people, and it was this, this kind of like, we have to keep protection from evil up uh, on one of us at least, so she can't possess both, and then she would... It was just great. There was tons of decisions to make. Really, really frantic the sense of we have to do this quickly because the vines are coming, the vines are coming. They kept coming up the hill and grabbing them as they're wrapping them. And the, the idea was it would wrap them up and then pull them towards the tree. And then the tree, when you're pressed against it, it burned you and then it tried to drain you. The tendrils would enter you and put you into this soporific state and drain you of your constitution. So they had to keep the vines, which only did like a D4 damage when they like wrapped around you and crushed you a bit. But the, the, the danger was now you were wrapped up and then you were dragged towards the tree and then that was really bad because then you'd get your constitution drained. So they were they, they were like, we have to keep these things off. And so Titus was using burning hands everywhere, trying to burn the vines as they came up. He was, you know, trying to keep the, the ghoulish things off them, which they managed to do. They killed them. And it was just great. It was super cinematic. And there was one really great cinematic moment that happened. Um, Arthur failed his wisdom check to resist being, or charisma, it was wisdom, to fail, it should have been charisma, now that I think back, but it was a wisdom check to resist being possessed, and he and he was, and Arthur was trying to rescue Brother Kylan, or sorry, Ulysses was trying to rescue Brother Kylan from the altar inside the hut, and so Arthur uh, loads his gun and he turns and he points it right at Ulysses, and Ulysses like pauses and looks at him, super cinematic, and then he pulls the trigger and he rolled a two, which is a misfire. <laughs> so the gun jammed. It was so good. It was like that moment in the movie, right? Where it's like, oh no, oh no. And then it, the gun jams. It was like, you know, a super cinematic moment. It was so good. And then, of course, uh, he used a prediction from evil on him and drove out the, the demon. So it was, or the, the creatures, the spirit. It was so good. <laughs> anyway, they, 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 they slew the heart inside. And when they killed it, all the rumbling stopped. The vines stopped. And that's where we left off. So Brother Kylan's been rescued. Esmeralda's been rescued. Um, Abner was with them, but he got knocked out. Uh, he tried to stab the heart. Um, there was a shadow around. He tried to stab it. Failed his wisdom check and passed out. He went to zero hit points. Um, after that, they knew they had to. They couldn't cross the, the shadow. They had to attack it with ranged weapons, or they had to uh, use protection from evil before they did. And so that's what they did. It was an awesome cinematic fight, and that's where we stopped. So really, the players have told me what they're doing next, and that's going up to the Abbey. Because they know that they have to talk to Esmeralda. I mean, so they have to talk to um, Irina. They have to talk to the abbot. They need information. Oh, that's the other thing that happened. Uh, when they were in, when they were at the winery, that night they were kind of up in one of the high buildings of the winery. They had decided to rest high so they could see out of the countryside around it at night as best they could. And they were looking out to the southeast, and they saw that from the direction of Velaki, so really far away in the night sky, there was an orange glow as if there was a fire. So parts of Velaki have burned. 
and I'll talk about that <laughs> when they get back there. The idea, I think, is that um, when they were there, they had heard that the City Watch were keeping um, gunpowder in various uh, caches around the city, and I think someone went around and blew them up. So, uh, so the, the city has basically no gunpowder left. <laughs> that there, at least, there's no. I mean, that, that there, the city, you know, the, the stores blew up, burned down large portions of the city. People panicked, and now they just don't have very much left ammunition. And so, what that means, of course, is now the uh, the ghouls can attack uh, during St. Andrew's Feast, which I'm going to run when the players get back. And Valaki is just going to be overrun, and it's going to be a mess. And they're going to have to do what they can to help, or not. They could run, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. So a St. Andrew's Feast is definitely happening when they get back to Velaki, if they go back to Velaki, which I think they have to if they're going back to Ravenloft eventually. So the question is now what is happening up at the Abbey, because that's where they're going to go next. I'm sure they're going to take Brother Kylan back to Kresik, and then he will lead them to the Abbey and say, they saved my life. You know, these are great heroes. And the question of what is happening up at the Abbey. Now, I had a whole thing planned for the Abbey. I had that the abbot was going to be sort of a Dr. Frankenstein, as he is in Curse of Strahd, that he was trying to prepare a vessel for Strahd. And I still might do that. I still might do that. But I think one of the things that's been going on is it's been very clear the players have always been like, I don't know, there's been a lot of we have to rescue so-and-so because they're about to be destroyed. We have to rescue so-and-so because they're about to be sacrificed. We have to rescue so-and-so because, like, it's always kind of been, like, we have to go, we have to go, we have to go. And I like that, but there's already a few timers running now. They know that there's something happening with Ismark. They know that there's something happening back at Velaki. And when they get to Velaki, there's going to be a whole bunch of chaos, and they're going to have to save people. And I think I need a moment of respite. They've had a bunch of chaos really recently, especially with this big fight at the Golfia Street. And so I think I'm going to let them have it at the Abbey. But here's what's going to happen. The Abbot is going to be normal-ish. But once he gets the book, once he sees the book, he's going to try to read it, and it's going to unleash craziness at the Abbey. It's going to be, it's going to be a, a sign of how dangerous. So they're going to have a good conversation with him. He's going to get it. He's going to read it. He's going to be able to tell them the history of Strahd. And then they're going to rest there or something like that. There's going to be a reason for them to stay. And in the course of that night, the abbey will be attacked because the book will have been read or whatever it is. And the monk, the, the monks will be, you know, destroyed. The, the abbot will be destroyed and there will be an attack and it'll be crazy. So the abbey will be under assault. And maybe that will even be the, the prelude to what's going on in Kresik and Velaki. Because now we know Strahd is back. They've had the vision and they're going to have more visions of him demanding the book. And so they're going to take it to the Abbey, and then he'll talk about how maybe to stop him with the book. And then I think, essentially, he's going to tell them of three things that they can get, or two things they can get. One is the icon of Ravenloft. And I think what I'm going to do mechanically with that is it, it allows everybody to have an instant rest. The whole party can have an instant full rest. So their hit points go back to full, uh, their stress goes down, they recover any lost spells. I think that's what I'm going to have it uh, be. So, essentially, it's a reset. The icon of Ravenloft, if you uphold it, the, the power of Ravenloft comes upon you and you can use this once. So I think that's what I will do, which is a huge boon, right? Because if they're in a big fight with Strahd or they're in a big fight in the castle and they're starting to go down, that would be the way thing to do. So I think I will do that, the, the icon of Ravenloft. So they'll, it'll be somewhere in the world. I don't know where exactly. Maybe it'll be in Ravenloft, but I don't think so. The other thing is the Sun Sword. I think the, the people in the town have recovered it. But then they will have lost it again somewhere nearby, or it will have been it will have been lost, and so they can go rescue that too. Because the Sun Sword is also really important if they're gonna they're level five. The party just got to level five, which means they have some really powerful stuff. Fireball, for example, um, uh, Titus just got Fireball, and he rolled his talent, and he gets advantage on one of the spells he knows, so he has advantage to cast Fireball now. So that's a really powerful spell that he can cast consistently. But um, it's going to be DC 14 to cast, or DC 13, I guess. So it's it's a chance he can fail at a higher chance than others, but he has, has advantage on that. So he's probably going to have Fireball reliably, um, which means that they are now a lot more powerful and can handle a lot bigger threats than they could before. So level 5 is a big change. It's a big change for them. Especially getting Titus. I mean, getting a, a wizard in Shadow Dark is huge, because suddenly the, the damage output goes way up. So that means I can throw a lot cooler stuff at them. So I think the Abbey fight is going to be crazy. That's my goal. But before that, they're going to learn the whole story. They're going to learn what the icon of Ravenloft, where it is. They're going to learn about the Sun Sword and what it does. And they're going to learn um, just basically the, the, the whole kit and caboodle. The Abbot will tell them it all. And then as he's preparing to help them, perhaps, something horrible will happen at the Abbey. 
So that's, that's what I, I think is going to happen. I don't know if I'm gonna do any prep in this particular video. I know I just said I was going to, but I think I'm gonna wait until a couple more days. I'm gonna think about this a bit more. I don't know if I'll do the prep on video, but I'll talk about the prep that I did in my next uh, recap. Depending on how big this session is, depending on how epic it is, I might do another video right afterwards, or I might, if it's just the role playing and the big battle stuff doesn't happen, I might wait until that also happens. But I think next session will be the respite. They, they return from Yester Hill, they get to Kresik, they find out that everything is going downhill fast, right? That the people of Kresik have started to fall into that same malaise that we had at Barovia. The mists have now started to creep through the whole town. People have started to go missing. Maybe there's even signs of vampires. Um, and like, it, it's bad. It's bad everywhere now. And then they have to go up to the Abbey, have to be a little bit of breather, a little safety, talking about what's going on there. And then they'll have to get back to Velaki after whatever happens it, at the Abbey. Anyway, hope this has been interesting. Um, yeah, this series, I mean, I'm having so much fun running through this campaign. I think we'll be done by summer. That's my goal. You know, it's funny. My, initially, I had hoped to be done by Christmas. And then we certainly weren't anywhere near an ending. We could have been if the players had decided to go straight for Ravenloft. They decided not to. So the campaign's still going. But I, I think at this rate, we'll be done by summer. That's my, that's my goal in mind, and I think that's where my players want to be too. I think we want to be done with the campaign by summer. We're all having a blast. I think everyone's having fun. Um, I'm really enjoying the, the, the way the players are playing, the role-playing. I am ready to be done running the gothic horror style for a while. So, I mean, I again, I'm having a blast. Certainly by summer, I think I will be tired of it. <laughs> but I, I, I'm looking forward to the end of the campaign because it'll be super cool as we get there. All right, guys. Well, anyway, I'll see you around.